Hey there everyone, how's it going? It's uh, Russell, welcome to the Reading Fabrico, hope you're doing well, hope you're reading lots of books. Today I'm going back to my Cormac McCarthy reading project which I started about a month ago, unfortunately I sort of went a bit off track for a while there, but I'm going to continue on by doing a reread of one of the books that at the time I considered one of the better Cormac McCarthy books out of the lot, even though I think they're all great. It's uh, No Country for Old Men, published in 2005, about a year before The Road. And those two books really just shot him up to the stratosphere, basically. I mean, they're the, the, the two highest selling books in his bibliography. If you look on Goodreads, they're the highest rated books. They just really propelled him into a new readership. And um, in, in all honesty, it's what introduced me to his work as well, including the uh, Coen Brothers film No Country for Old Men, and to a lesser extent, the John Hillcock film The Road as well. Um, I'm, I'm not as enamored with The Road as everyone else is. I don't think it's one of his better pieces of uh, fiction, writing, whatever you want to call it. But I was enamored with No Country for Old Men, and I wanted to give it another reread since uh, after reading The Drop by Dennis Lehane, it's been a long time since I've done a uh, crime fiction, crime thriller apart from that. And I remember No Country being a really taut, just real tight, tightly paced, fast paced bit of thriller. And um, I just want to go back to it and just see how I'd uh, approach it six years after reading it and truthfully it, it was an amazing experience just it's it's an absolute pleasure to go back and reread a Cormac McCarthy novel particularly one that I liked the first time around and probably potentially liked it even more the second time around there's a lot of aspects in this book that I really really like uh, one, one way to describe it is that it's sort of the writing is very simplistic compared to his previous books and that is due to the fact that this originally started out as a screenplay which he then expanded into a novel which then the Coen brothers took that novel and um, diluted it down to the, into their own screenplay as well so this book uh, in some parts reads as a screenplay but there's still enough expansion in there to be able to uh, forego the movie if you if you show, so choose to and just really see the characters in a more three-dimensional term um, there's a lot there's a lot in this book here that isn't explained in the movie so it gives you it gives you a fuller story and I'm all, all the more for that I think it's I think it's fantastic there's a lot of sections in this book that really hit me hard uh, there's a lot of great set pieces in this novel I mean, it basically is a cat and mouse chase all the way through to basically the second half of the book and um, I didn't find any flaws in this book. I still don't think it's his best work. I mean, I, I still rank, you know, Sutri and Blood Meridian and even the new Stella Maris higher than No Country, but uh, this is still a great starting point. Uh, when people ask me what book do I recommend as a beginning point for Cormac McCarthy, I mean, the two that I genuinely uh, say to them would be All the Pretty Horses and No Country for Old Men. They're the two that I would start with. Or if you want to go back to his more Southern Gothic era, maybe Child of God. But uh, I still stand by No Country as being one of the beginner works that you should start with. Um, it, 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 it doesn't throw you in the deep end. It's a good way to get used to his writing style before, before it expands into the more, um, I guess you could say, difficult styles of uh, Blood Meridian, and in particular Suchery. That first five pages of Suchery really threw me off before I finally got on his wavelength. But just as a piece of story, I mean, a lot of his books tend to forego the story in favour of themes and ideas. This still has the themes and ideas, but there is a story at the heart of it, a real good, tight thriller of a story um, that keeps you immersed, that keeps you hooked. And you, you follow all these various, these three basic characters as they traverse the Texan and Mexican border, trying to, trying to solve everything while all hell breaks loose around them. The tale of Llewellyn Moss, who is a Vietnam vet and a welder, by trade and he's out in the desert plains hunting and he stumbles upon a drug deal gone wrong there's cars there's bodies everywhere uh, one person survives he's he's badly shot he's in the car but he survives he asks for water Low Island doesn't have any water and through this bloodshed and this massacre he finds the remaining person who's about a mile away under a tree with a briefcase, and this briefcase contains millions of dollars, enough to keep Llewellyn going for the rest of his life, enough for him to retire on. And he takes it, and he almost gets away with it. He almost gets away with it, but just that morality, that moral sense gets to him. And in the middle of the night, he gets up, gets some water, he takes it back to where to the site where all this happened. Uh, but he finds out that the guy's been shot dead, and he's on his way back to his car, and he sees another car there, popping his tires, taking his license plates, and they're chasing after him. He screwed up. Just one simple mistake has led to all these ramifications that proceed throughout the rest of the book. And now he is on the run. He takes his um, he gets his wife, who I think is 19 years old, Carla Jean, um, sends her to live 
to send her to her mother's house or her grandmother's house actually and then he proceeds to take the money and hop from town to town to hotel to hotel trying to outpace outrun both the mexicans and the secondary character in this book who goes by the name of um who goes by the name of anton Chigurh, who is a who's basically described as exotic looking with pale eyes uh, sort of a darkish complexion but someone someone that you just you pay attention to and you listen to them even if you don't want to who is the very definition of a psychopath. I mean, up until the release of this book, his most memorable character would have to be the judge from Blood Meridian. But I think Anton is a close second. He's, um, there's just something about him. He just, he, he just, he can find anything. He knows his way around. He just knows how to talk and really get under people's skin. There's a great scene in the book, which is also in the movie, probably one of the most popular scenes in the movie, where he's at a gas station and he, decides to call the fate of this gas station attendant by use of a coin and he, he just really really just gets under the nerves of this guy he really freaks him out and it's it's one of many sequences throughout the book which are just absolutely sublime Re real real thriller stuff really keeps you reading i mean this book here i just i steamrolled through i got through it so quickly and I'm, I'm glad I'm glad that there are sections in this book that really help you get immersed in the um, in the location and the ideals and the themes the themes and the situations and the themes itself are all to do with morality and the evil of man I mean if I was to describe the two books it would be those two things the morality and the evil of man so when Anton Chigurh is hired to try and track down the money and then the third character in the book is Sheriff Bell who is an aging an aging lawman who gets pulled into this situation and he cannot make heads or tails of it he's just it's unlike anything he's seen before uh, he talks a lot especially in the opening chapters in the opening chapter of every chapter of this book uh, he pretty much has a lot has a self-reflection just every every part every page is him reflecting on everything around him and coming to terms with not just evil but with his own thoughts about the world around him and how it's changed since he was a kid uh probably one wonderful absolutely wonderful stuff in fact uh sheriff bell is probably my favorite character in the whole book i'd say when i read this book about six maybe seven years ago i would have said that uh Loyola moss would have been my favorite character and he's he's the main character he's the one that you follow he's the one that you sort of want to win whereas Whereas Anton Chigurh is sort of the one that you you want to find out more about. You want to get into his psyche. You want to find out about his psychology and the way he proceeds through life. He's the most interesting character in the book. But for me, the one that I resonated with was Sheriff Bell. So <laughs> I don't know if that's an age thing. Where ever since, since in those past six years, I've thought maybe I've grown up a bit more and become a bit more self-reflective. But I just really agreed with a lot, a lot of what Bell was d describing in this book, or what Cormac was describing on behalf of Bell in this book. And in particular, the opening sections, the sections where he talk, where he goes to visit his uncle Ellis, and they talk about the uh, the war, um, and his his views on the nature of man and the nature of evil, and morality, just really hit me hard. I mean, there's some for a, for a real thriller of a book, for a crime novel, almost a pulp novel. There are some heady themes here that are just way beyond all the other books out there of its type. I mean, it really just it really gets at the heart of what it's trying to do and does it damn near perfectly. So getting back to Bell, he um he tries to track down he tries to track down Llewellyn Moss. The Mexicans are after him because they want the money. Anton Chigurh is after him. Eventually, the the uh, the company that wants the money back hires another hitman by the name of Carson Wells, who is an ex special forces, and all of this. All of this collides and turns into shootouts that happen at various hotels. Some of the most visceral stuff you'll read in a long time. A lot of blood going on here. There's a lot of talks of being shot in the face. There's a lot of talks about Anton using this weapon that's almost like the one that they use to kill cows, but they put an air compressor thing against their head and pop it and it shoots a hole through their head. There's a brilliantly described section at the beginning where after he um, basically escapes from jail, uh, by, by killing the policeman there. He takes the cock, cock car, sirens down this other car, pulls him out of the car, and then the way it's described is it, it describes him as being almost like a faith healer, putting his um, hand up to the guy's forehead before killing him. 
beautiful, beautiful descriptions like that. That just, that just stuff that only Cormac can come up with. And there's, it's littered throughout the book. There are so many great moments. And even though this is probably his most simplistically descriptive book, I mean, technically this is this is a screenplay in parts. There are still moments. There are still paragraphs and passages, which just really, really remind me why. I love Cormac McCarthy, why I think he's the greatest living writer. This is definitely the easiest book of his to read, and um, it has still got violence. I mean, it's, it's Cormac McCarthy, so it has to have violence. And it's, it's still got those heavy themes. But as a populist piece of fiction, um, I can see why so many people gravitate towards this book and are aware of this book, especially with regards to the movie as well, which was a huge success. But I also think it's because each of these characters are well developed. You get a sense for how they think as a person, how they solve situations. And what's what's also not talked about a lot of Court McCarthy is the humour. There's there's not really an ounce of humour in a lot of his work. But there is in this book. There's actually a, some good sections of dark humour that sort of pop up here and there and to be which are almost like palate cleansers and they're obviously one of particular the conversations he has with his wife Carla uh, after he brings some money home or even when he he shows up basically dressed in a hospital gown at a clothes store and he asks him oh do you get many people coming here wearing nothing at all and he goes no I don't think I do <laughs> so there's just little bits here and there that just help offset the the tragedy and the moroseness of some of some of his writing, especially when it comes to the visceral violence that you get in quite a lot of it. But if I was to boil it down to all one thing, it's just a cat and mouse thriller. A cat and mouse thriller that for the first half is just tightly wounded. You're waiting for it to explode. It explodes, and then the second half of the book is very reflective. It gives you a lot more of uh, Sheriff Bell and his thought process regarding all the situations, and I found those to be the strongest aspects of the book. When I first read this book, uh, I thought the first half was a lot stronger than the second half, but I think I've changed on that now. I think given my, my progress as a reader and what I've come to value more in terms of writing and themes, I think the second half of No Country for Old Men is up there with the best of his work, and um, it was a real surprise to me as to how much I really like this and, and, and how quick I was to get through it as well. A lot of Sheriff Bell's stuff and monologues even, are all the ones that I've highlighted, they're the, they're the passages that resonate with me most, and I thought I'd share a few with you. So this is on page four. They say the eyes are the windows to the soul. I don't know what them eyes was the windows to, and I guess I'd as soon not know. But there is another view of the world out there, and other eyes to see it, and that's where this is going. It has done brought me to a place in my life. I would not have thought I'd have come to somewhere out there is a true and living prophet of destruction, and I don't want to confront him. I know he's real. I have seen his work. I walk in front of those eyes once. I won't do it again. That's in the um, opening sort of reflection paragraph that's pr that precedes every chapter as told by Sheriff Bell. Those, those are my favorite parts in the book, actually, is the opening chapter of every part. Next is a conversation between Carson Wells and the man who's hired him, who wants to find out more about Anton Chigurh. How Just how dangerous is he? Well shrugged, compared to what? The bubonic plague? He's bad enough that you called me. He's a psychopathic killer, but so what? There's plenty of them around. That line's quite famous because it's in the movie as well. And and even in that line that I just read to you, you get a hint of dark humour in there. It's, just, it's, it's, it's peppered throughout this book, and I'm, I'm all the more thankful for it. I mean, I, I would love to see more, more humour like that. I still think the funniest book of his is Sartre, but um, No Country has some great sections here and there. This is another section from the opening paragraph from Chapter 8, as told by Sheriff Bell. I've lost a lot of friends over these last few years, not all of them older than me neither. One of the things you realise about getting older is that not everybody is going to get older with you. You try to help the people they're paying your salary and of course you can't help but think about the kind of record you leave. Uh, another section involves Sheriff talking to Llewellyn Moss's father. Uh, another great moment, one of the highlights of the book for me is this conversation here. He turned and looked at me, and then I thought he looked a lot older. His eyes looked old. He said, people will tell you it was Vietnam brought this country to its knees, but I never believed that. It was already in bad shape. Vietnam was just the icing on the cake. We didn't have nothing to give them to take over there. If we'd sent them without rifles, I don't know, as they'd have been all that much worse off. You can't go to war like that. You can't go to war without God. I don't know what is going to happen when the next one comes. I surely don't. So there's a bit of proph prophesizing right there, and... um. It, there are talks of religion in this book and God himself and yeah, just in general, just philosophy. 
the philosophy of death. And um, that's something I'll take away from this book quite a lot. And the final one, this is the very final page. Now I want to preface this by saying this, this does not spoil the book in any way, in any way, shape or form. It's got nothing to do with the story. This is just Sheriff Bell or basically retelling a dream he has. And as with any Cormac McCarthy book, I have to tell a dream sequence because for some reason when I think of him, I think of dreams. And this one is a classic right here. And if you've seen the movie, you will know exactly what it is because it's in the final scene of that movie too. But the second one, it was like we was both back in the older times and I was on horseback going through the mountains of a night, going through this pass in the mountains. It was cold and there was snow on the ground and he rode past me and kept on going. Never said nothing. He just rode on past and he had this blanket wrapped around him and he had his head down and when he rode past, I seen he was carrying fire in a horn the way people used to do and I could see the horn from the light inside of it about the color of the moon and in the dream I knew that he was going on ahead and that he was fixing to make a fire somewhere out there in all that dark and all that cold and I knew that whenever I got there he would be there and then I woke up. This is a damn fine book. It's, 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 it's one of his shorter works. There is not an ounce of fat on this thing. You can speed through it in a quick time. There are three main characters and it hops to each character in just the right amount, of, giving them just the right, right amount of time each. And watching their storylines just collide and interweave is uh, why I think this is a well-written book. Uh, is it one of my favorite Cormac McCarthy books? No, but that doesn't mean it's bad. It's still a great novel and I highly recommend it. And as a beginner piece of work, I'd recommend this uh, to anybody who wants to get into Cormac McCarthy's work. This or All the Pretty Horses are the ones I'd recommend as beginners for beginner Cormac McCarthy readers. It's, it's a wonderful piece of American fiction and or neo neo western you can actually call it and it's utterly compelling and just it be it's bewildering it's just you're reading the words of this great man who has published so few novels and you just wish he would publish more in his lifetime but you get what you're given and um each one is a treasure in itself rereading this book made me realize that um I, I love his work just as much the second time as i did the first time the first time reads are all surface level reads and the second time i sort of dig into it deeper and try and find different different things that i missed out on and um it's an absolute treat getting these hidden treasures hidden easter eggs in these in these works of his and just being able to pontificate on it and ponder it uh i've, I've yet to be let down by Court mccarthy and I really hope you like this book as much as I do. Yeah, that's all there is to it. Thanks very much and see you on the next one. Bye.